Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna be focusing on the Commodore 264 series of machines. I have some examples of them here. We have the Commodore 116, the Commodore 16, and the Commodore Plus 4. I think there might be one other model as well that I don't have, but these computers all architecturally are very similar and very different than the Commodore 64. One common trait of these machines is that they are very difficult to keep running. There are numerous ICs inside of these machines that are bespoke, like they're only found in these computers, and those ICs have a tendency to die. And when they do, it's not like you can find replacements from other Commodore machines. It has to come from one of these, otherwise the machine is dead in the water. Like the Commodore 64, the 264 series of Commodore machines have a PLA chip inside that is not that different than the Commodore 64 PLA. But unfortunately, of course, even though it's called a PLA, you can't just swap the one from the 64 into one of these and have a working machine. So on today's video, I'm gonna be talking about a PLA replacement for these series of machines and one that is easy to get and inexpensive. Let's get right to it. In case you're not familiar with what the PLA is, it stands for Programmable Logic Array. And the original PLA in the Commodore 64 used the Signetics 82S100, which was a logic chip invented in the mid 70s. This chip allowed Commodore to take a whole bunch of 74LS logic chips and combine them into a single IC. It's one of the reasons why the Commodore 64 motherboard actually isn't filled with a ton of little chips. And if you compare it to the Commodore PET motherboard, you'll notice the number of ICs has been reduced greatly even though the 64 can do so much more than the Commodore PET from a functionality standpoint. This is my Commodore 16, which I've shown on the channel before. This thing's had some mods done to it, and one of them is I can switch on the fly between PAL and NTSC. So right now it's running in PAL because you can see that the borders on the top and bottom are somewhat thick. If I hold down the reset button, and I wait for the power LED to flash once, and I let go, watch what happens. It will now switch into NTSC, and there it is. The color purple is a little bit different, and the border on the top and bottom is now not as thick, which indicates it's running in NTSC mode, which has less scan lines. Removing the cover reveals the motherboard here where you can see some of my mods. Uh, this is an Arduino and a clock synthesizer chip, which is required for this PAL NTSC switching. Not to mention I have a different EEPROM here in an adapter that allows me to switch between the two different kernel images, and the Arduino is doing that. I have a video on this entire mod which I will link to in the description below. So if you're interested in seeing that yourself, check that out. I've also upgraded the RAM in this machine to 64K, which is these two chips from the original 16K. It's a very simple mod. I think there's maybe a bodge wire on the bottom to bring an extra line to these and the extra address line to address the RAM. Underneath these three heat sinks here is the 6510 CPU from the Commodore 64 that is offset in a socket here, and there's a couple wires that connect some pins around just to make it compatible. But this thing had a dead CPU, so it was completely not working until I did this particular mod. And finding CPUs for this machine is very difficult. And it's underneath these three heat sinks right here where the PLA chip resides. Now this motherboard design is for this Commodore 16. Of course, it's a different layout in the other machines of this same architectural design, but they all use the same PLA chip. And just like in the Commodore 64, if this chip dies, it has the same effect. You just get nothing when you turn on the computer. Black screen, basically. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you may remember the Commodore 64 GAL PLA replacement project designed by the Dutchman Daniel Mantioni. He used essentially easy to obtain GAL chips on a small PCB to replace the PLA in a Commodore 64, and it uses the original equations from the original C64 PLA, so it really is a one-to-one -one replacement. And because the GAL chips work in a very similar way to the original PLA in the 64, there are no compatibility issues with using the GAL PLA project. Daniel released the code and the PCB design files for the C64 GAL PLA replacement, and looking at eBay now, I see a lot of people selling them, which means that he has kind of disrupted the replacement PLA market for the C64. These gals are incredibly easy to obtain from China, 
very easy to solder together because it's just through hole parts and pretty much easy enough for anyone to make with very inexpensive parts. Well, Daniel has gone ahead and done the same thing again, but this time for this series of machines, he has come up with a GAL replacement PLA for this series that uses a single PAL or GAL 16 V8 chip. He's gone ahead and sent me a kit, so I'm gonna assemble this today and we're gonna test this out. I'm gonna cut open this bag here. I always find these very fiddly and hard to open. So let's take a look at what parts uh, we're gonna be dealing with. I think this is a little bit simpler than the one for the 64. Ah, uh, yes, okay, so this is actually two kits. So they're joined together on a PCB here. So let me try to break these without snapping <laughs> the PCB. Okay, there we go. Yep, two PCBs. So we have two kits for two machines. That's awesome. And as I had mentioned, you'll notice only one GAL chip or PAL chip per PLA. That's different than the 64 one, which needs two. And that's because on the 64, the equations needed for all the logic is just more complicated and takes up more space than one of these uh, ICs can handle. But on this series of machines, obviously it's simpler. So one 16 V8 is all you need. Daniel told me that when the 64 project came out, he did get a lot of requests for the C16 one. So even though I said that it doesn't seem like there's as much demand for this, clearly there is demand. So these PLA chips must be failing as well, rendering machines useless. Now, right off the bat, I'll mention that similar to the C64 project, this project is also available for anyone to download. So you don't need to buy this from Daniel if you wanna make one of these yourself. But of course, he will be selling these kits. I think he'll be selling the PCBs alone, uh, but the kit includes everything you see here. Well, obviously half as much because it will be for one uh, of these. Actually, I think what he will also include is some of these little pin headers here. So uh, you can plug this into the socket on the motherboard without damaging it. And just like the last project, Daniel has really nice kit build instructions. If you buy the kit from him, of course, you'll get these instructions included. And here is a list of what's included in the kit. We get one GAL 16 V8. You could use, of course, a PAL 16 V8. Uh, the GAL is the reprogrammable version of this chip versus a PAL, which is one time programmable. Two 14 pin male strip headers. That's what goes into the motherboard socket. We got six diodes and they are our BAV 21s. One resistor between 3.3K ohm and 10K ohm and one 20 pin IC socket or of course you can use header strips as well if you want. Pause the video right here if you wanna read these more closely. I'm not gonna go over all the assembly steps. I'm just going to quickly assemble one of the kits. Putting this together is really quite easy and nothing difficult at all. When inserting the diodes, just take note of the stripe on the PCB and line that up with the stripe on the diode. The installation instructions say to insert the diodes and resistor first, then you do the chip socket for the GAL chip, and then you install the pin headers last. For the pin headers, I like to take another socket and you stick the pin headers into it, and then you place the PCB on top of that. And that just makes sure that the pin headers are as straight as possible Otherwise, when you solder them on, it can be really easy to get them crooked, and then it's not gonna go into the motherboard easily. All right, and I'm all done with the soldering. Obviously, I didn't use this uh, included socket. I don't like these. I find these fail quite a bit, so I have a whole bunch of these round hole, machined hole sockets. I prefer to use those. Incidentally, when I'm filming this video, we're having a bit of an ice storm in Portland and the lights have been flickering in the basement again. I didn't capture it on camera this time. I'm hoping that I don't lose power. Um, and people had asked last time if I have a UPS. I do have a UPS that runs most of my equipment down in the lab here. So it, it supplies power to a lot of the outlets. But the lighting uh, that's both on the ceiling, my bench lighting, all this stuff, that is not on the UPS, so if the power goes out, I will be in the dark for the most part. I have a few little lights here and there that are on battery backup, but most things are not. Anyhow, it's a really good idea to inspect your work after you put stuff together because I just noticed that there is a solder bridge right there. 
There we go, that was easy to fix. It's because um, when I'm doing the soldering on this, I have cameras and stuff in the way, so it's harder for me to look very closely at this. I wouldn't normally have missed that while I was making it, but it is, is a reminder, it's always a good idea to inspect your work. Daniel had included two of these programmed 16 V8s, but if you are making one of these yourself, of course, just like on the Commodore 64, you use something like the TL-866 programmer here, which has no problem at all uh, programming these chips. Now these chips are easy to get from places like eBay and AliExpress. They are not made anymore, so they will be old chips that were either pulled off boards or new old stock, things like that. But these programmers definitely are still made. They work on Windows, Mac OS, and I think there are now software for Linux, open source software. So you can absolutely plug this into your computer via USB and very easily program these chips. I do highly recommend one of these programmers if you don't already have one. They are fantastic. I've had this one for quite a long time. It's actually the first generation of this programmer. There's a Model 2 now, which has a little bit more support of some types of chips, but it also loses support of certain old EEPROMs. So I do keep this thing around because I like that old support. But anyways, easy to get. You can program these up, no problem, just like the C64. So next thing to do is test this out in a real machine. The Commodore 16 is reconnected and we power this on, just make sure everything at least seems to be working. I've had some flaky issues with my little mod circuit here. So recently I had to solder all the cables onto it. I was using DuPont connectors. They suck. The ones you buy from China, they get kind of loose after time. Well, they're not even good from the beginning, but they get loose. And it got to the point where I just like touched these wires and the computer would shut off, reboot, just do crazy things. Permanently attaching these has solved that problem, although it makes it a little harder to remove this thing if I need to, although the connections on the motherboard are not soldered. Anyways, it's working, the computer comes up. Let me quickly boot up the diagnostic cartridge. This was the original typing tutor cartridge. I just cracked it open. It had a socketed ROM chip, so I replaced that with an EEPROM with this diagnostic ROM. That way I can fully test these machines very easily. This is an open source project. I think it's open source. I'll put a link to the diagnostic ROM so you can download it, but it's modern and it's made by, well, let's see who it is. When I turn it on, it shows his name. I forgot right off the top of my head plays these sort of diagnostic patterns. Here we go, Rob Clark. He designed this, this diagnostic. The color cycling you're seeing here is absolutely normal. This build is from 2019. There's probably a newer version. It is saying my kernel ROM is bad, but that's completely understood. And that's because my kernel rod ROM has been modified to support the 6510. Now I think, if I recall reading, Rob has actually updated his diagnostic ROM to recognize the modified kernel ROM for the 6510. Oh, now it's saying bad keyboard, by the way, because I don't have a loopback connector connected, and it's probably gonna say the joysticks are bad because I also don't have the loopback connector connected to that. But needless to say, it's testing the primary functionality of this machine, which is the RAM and the PLA and the interrupts, and of course, it's gonna be testing the graphics as well through the, the TED chip. Turn that down, sorry about that. There we go, this is all the TED chip diagnostics. So if you have a bad TED chip, you may see issues. All right, everything looks good. So it's time to install this PLA into this computer. And what's really nice is he writes right on the top there, the, the chip IC markings on the motherboard for the various machines. C16 is U16, C116 is U101, and the plus four is U19. Thank you very much, Daniel. I've ranted a lot about people not putting any markings on the silk screen on these PCBs they make. Daniel has taken that to heart and he has put so many markings to make this thing so easy to put together and install in the machine. So I'm gonna pop out U16, the PLA that's in here. Here it is. Now I had heat sinks on here because of course this chip does get warm just like the Commodore 16 or 64 PLA rather. So I thought maybe that would preserve its life a little bit. Who knows if that's for real or not. Oh, my only slight nitpick, Daniel, is you try to draw the notch. I can see it, the line here that goes along the top cuts out where the notch would be, but you have the markings for the IC sockets kind of where that notch would be. So it's not super obvious. So when I first looked at this, I was like, which way does this go on? Now the notch of the, the gal chip is the same direction. So that's an indicator but perhaps you could just move these, uh, these little like words over to the side here and here, turn them 90 degrees, and that way the notch would not be overwritten. 
Anyhow, this just goes into the motherboard, and because it's using these very thin pin headers, which are very inexpensive from China, you can buy them yourself, or Daniel includes them. This should not damage this socket. So this should just push right in. There it is, just like that. I'm gonna pull out the diagnostic cartridge. Let's see, does this power up? Thumbs up, it works! How awesome! Let's put the diagnostic cartridge in and let this run through a full cycle and make sure that this, this project fully functions. Now, while the diagnostics are running through here, Daniel mentioned to me that the timing requirements for this design, this architecture, are not as stringent as they are on the C64. So from a compatibility perspective, there really shouldn't be any issues. Now, you can run these chips at 25 nanoseconds or 15 nanoseconds, just like that decision we had to make on the Commodore 64, but he said that really from his testing, there's no difference and everything is fully operational with this in there for him. And it seems to be working great for me on my NTSC machine. And in a second, we'll switch over to PAL mode, just make sure everything's working. I mean, really there should be no difference whatsoever between PAL and NTSC when it comes to the PLA timing. All right, a full cycle has gone through and everything is good. So I'm gonna hold down my reset button and I am gonna switch this thing into PAL mode. There we go, if I let go, it's gonna now reboot and be in PAL. And let's let it run through another couple cycles just to make sure there's no issues. And there we go, this is on the second cycle of the PAL test and it tested all fine as well. I've been playing various games and everything seems to be working exactly as it did on this machine. Now, not all is well because my 6510 CPU replacement does introduce some incompatibilities. So I'm not able to run all games, but everything that I was able to run on this machine is still working perfectly with Daniel's PLA replacement in there. So this is a real viable alternative to the original PLA being dead. So if your Commodore 264 series machine has a bad PLA, rest assured that Daniel's PLA replacement project does work perfectly. Once again, Daniel does the amazing and brings the community a project which can help revive these old machines where otherwise you're either left spending quite a bit more money or you have a machine that doesn't work at all. Now, as I had mentioned before, this machine has other bespoke chips that when they die, renders the computer either totally unusable or you lose some functionality. And Daniel has been busy working on projects to replace those chips as well with easily commonly available parts. And of course, this will be an open project for the community. So it won't be something that only he sells. It'll be something that you will be able to make yourself. So watch for that in upcoming videos. But for everything I've talked about so far in this video, don't forget to check the description below where I will have links to all the various project files and information you may need if you wanna buy one of these or build one of these yourself. And that is gonna be it. Thumbs up if you liked this video and otherwise you know what to do. And stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>